<laughs> I was so frustrated with the insurance. It was horrible. And I actually jumped the gun and I just said, I'm done. And I just sent letters to all insurance companies saying, I'm done. And I'll almost sink the ship. Yeah. But, you know, I started talking to Jared and pulled some of those letters and then did the process gradually. And, and over the time, it just worked. It was like, it's not that we actually expanded our sessions to spend more time with patients. We actually had less visits. You know, we were just not really mill anymore. And while we were making more money, I mean, it was great. I mean, Jerry's guidance, you know, it was so valuable. I think that I would be out of the business if I did my way. Hello and welcome back. Thank you so much for joining this episode is an interview with one of my mastermind coaching clients of about three years. Her name is Lily Bowich, and she's a private practice physical therapy owner in Seattle, Washington. And her story is really remarkable. She has transitioned in the last three years from uh, almost completely in network to almost completely out of network. But in the process, not only did she increase profit per visit, which is easy to do when you're dropping insurance contracts, but she's increased patient volume, added on other additional cash pay services, and has has grown her practice in the transition out of network. And now she's on track to have her first seven-figure year, predominantly cash pay. And next February, she will be 100% out of network and continuing this incredible growth trajectory. Super proud of what she and her team has done. And in this episode, you're going to learn all the things that she learned along the way, the things that worked, the things that didn't work, and everything that contributed to this incredible success story. And even if you're not in network right now or wanting to transition or drop contracts, there's a lot in here for you. And I especially want you to listen out for the strategies on adding continuity programs and memberships to your practice. This is something that any type of practice can add in to get that predictable, reliable monthly revenue or annual revenue on top of what you're already doing. And she's done it so well, and she's incredibly good at getting regular kind of plan of care, if you will, patients to roll into a conditioning program, as you'll hear about, and then from that into an actual ongoing membership. So, so much to learn for any type of practice owner in really any field of healthcare. So enjoy the interview. And if you like what you hear and you'd like to ask Lily your own questions, she is going to be our featured mastermind group member at the time of this recording next week. So when you hear this comes out, she'll be doing a live Q&A for all of our current mastermind coaching members. You can ask her anything and everything. If you've been inspired by her story, if you want more detail on anything that you hear in this episode today, you can join us at drjaredcarter.com forward slash mastermind, and you can get 50% off of your first First month if you use the promo code August 50. August 50, get a huge discount. Ask her anything and everything. If you're hearing this after the fact or well after this has been published, you can still join us to ask me and her any of your questions. I expect she'll be a member for years to come. I can tell she's a lifer, if you will. She's totally bought in based on the results she's gotten from having someone to ask her questions and now has become such a great support for so many of our members doing the same thing and just a wealth of information. So join us, please, at drjaredcarter.com forward slash mastermind. And with all that said, here is Lily Butch. Hello. What a pleasure to have you on the podcast. This is, <laughs> I feel like it's been a long time coming. We've been working together for, I guess, are we coming up on three years? Yeah. Yeah. Three years now. It's been an awesome, it's been an exciting three years, right? Yeah. I mean, a big, a big transition from mostly in network to mostly out of network and a lot of revenue growth every year. And now looking at seven figures this year. And I'm so proud of what you and your team have, have done. So why don't you tell the listeners and, and viewers a bit about yourself and what brought you up to kind of the point where you started your practice, what that practice looked like when you started out, and then we'll kind of go from there on how it's evolved over the last 10 years. So my name is Lily Boyd, and I'm a physical therapist in the state of Washington. I'm owner of Lily Physical Therapy, and I decided you know, to open my practice about 10 years ago. And my motivation was to create my playground, you know, to create a place where I can, 
you know, develop different program, you know, better programs to play with new technologies and to create the best place, you know, for patients to receive care and for best place, you know, for employees to work. And at the beginning, I was working just part time. And I was thinking that being in network with insurances is a must, you know, to serve as many people as we can. So I was working on my contracts for a while. And that actually turned out not to work on a long run. And over the time, you know, I started, you know, over the time, maybe like eight years later, I decided, you know, that that's not the best match for my brain. That was, you know, like a top notch boutique style concierge clinic offering, you know, state of the art training and state of the art technology. So that's when I started to working with you, Jared, you know, to to actually pull myself out of the entrance and create like more out of the network environment. And one of the motivations to do that was to have less dictation and control from insurance companies to provide the best care regardless of those limitations and to have less administrative burden and from insurances. And what, when you were at that, you know, year seven and year eight, and you're realizing being in network was just not going to be a good fit any longer. What did it feel like? What were the thoughts you were having when it came to actually taking action and figuring out how to go out of network? I mean, how did it feel? And what were your thoughts about how to move forward? You know, my first contract I dropped was United Healthcare, and I actually got on board with them and dropped them six months later. It was just financially not making any sense. And those patients were looking for not high-end care. They were just looking for traditional physical therapy that we don't provide. And what they were paying, you know, it was not covering, you know, overhead at all. Later, you know, when seven, eight years later, when we started talking about dropping big insurance companies that actually cover a lot of our patient care, like Medicare, the thought process, you know, it was like, you know, at the beginning, it was hard. You know, I was thinking, oh, well, like where those patients will find the care, how we'll do this, you know. It was a frustration with the system that's broken. It was almost like ethical question for me. But then one day I was sitting and thinking, you know, why I opened this clinic, why I'm doing what I'm doing. You know, I want a different place. I wanted high-end care. I wanted to incorporate and invest in high-end technology and talent. And that was impossible with insurances. And then I found the piece, you know, my care not being available to everybody, but being available for people who are willing to invest in their health. So the kind of ethical questions at first was, and I hear this all the time, it's like when you've got a network, you're limiting your care to only those who can afford it. But what I, I just heard from you and also what I've seen over time in my own practice and many others, it's not just people with a bunch of financial surplus. It's it literally is about people who have the mindset that they're going to invest higher than the average person in their healthcare and in their well-being and their health span, all of those factors. And so in my practice, I've seen so many people that were clearly struggling financially, but they were willing to go out a network to get what they felt like was going to get them the result that they were looking for so that they could do the things in their life that they need and want and love to do. And that's really, I think for, I just wanted to kind of point that out the way you worded it, because, because there are a lot of people that ha they struggle with that. And they think that, oh, if I do this, it's just going to be people either uninsured people, which is not the case, right? 99% of people going out of network still have health insurance or, you know, rich people. And, and that's also not the case. And, and so I just want to kind of highlight that point and that last thing that you had set, said there. So when you really said, all right, clearly I have to make this change in order to have the type of practice that I've always dreamed of, of having and, and provide the level of service that I, I've wanted to for the last, you know, seven, eight years, what were the next steps you took? And yeah, what were, maybe you could just kind of outline a few of the things that definitely clearly worked and maybe a couple of things that you might've tried or thought, or, you know, that, that clearly didn't serve you and your practice well. Yeah. What clearly worked in that process was working with you, Jared, you know, and 
you helped me go through this process slowly and gradually and strategize, you know, how we actually get out of the network, how we actually pick, you know, insurance that will drop next and and stay in business because, you know, pulling the trigger and dropping them all at the same time, you know, without having anything to replace it can actually sink the ship. Mm -hmm. And that was very, very beneficial. And it worked at this point, you know, we have, we dropped our insurance patients to 20% from 30% percent at the end, uh, at the beginning of the year. And we are moving to 15%. And then by February, we'll be completely out of the network. So that gradual approach really helped. When you start, or when we started the process a few years ago, you, how much how much was insurance versus the cash? Because you guys were doing some cash pay services, some of the modalities and, and technology and things you offered, you know, they were never covered services. What was the split? between kind of private pay and insurance-based, you know, percentages in your practice when you started? This year? No, no, not, no, like a few years ago when we started this process. Uh, oh. And okay, we're going to go from mostly in network to out of network. I just can't remember what the percentages were. It was, it was mostly insurance, maybe like mm -hmm. 70% insurance, 30% okay. cash. So, for those listening to this and thinking, man, I'd love to do the same thing. You know, I can say that along the way, not only did profits obviously improve, yeah, you know, your revenue per patient goes way up or your profit per patient goes up as well, but you, your revenues have climbed, right? You haven't just dropped insurances and lost patients and like retracted and just have like a higher profit per pay, per visit. Y'all are seeing more patients. So what do you think have been the key factors, whether it's marketing strategies or services that you've added. Walk us through what you think has worked to actually increase your patient numbers and now have you on a path for a seven-figure year, even though you're dropping insurance contracts. Yeah. I mean, what worked yeah, was incorporating diversity of programs. For example, you know, not just physical therapy and discharging people when, they, when their pain is gone, but incorporating conditioning program after physical therapy to make people solid, you know, to, to transition them to not just everyday activities, but, you know, to, to sports and a high level, high level of health. And then after that, you know, after conditioning as a third step, we incorporate in maintenance or membership. And that I think now we have about 50 members. And that really helped, you know, increase numbers, you know, maintain numbers while, dropping out. Most recently, we incorporated shockwave therapy, and we have about 20 visits a week. And we actually plan, you know, to go up to 30 visits a week by February 35, you know, so to compensate for the last insurance that will drop. Yeah. And, and so just to kind of highlight, and they, they've done such a good job, done such a good job of as you alluded to earlier, replacing what you might lose in volume of insurance-based appointments, because you're going to lose some, right? Some people mm -hmm. are not, not going to stay on, but as you know, new patients calling in, you're not going to get as many yeses, but you guys do a great job of still getting a lot of yeses, but, but replacing those things proactively with yeah. cash pay services of, of different types. So for you guys, things like Shockwave, electromagnetic red light. You've got all kinds of awesome things. I wish I was in Seattle so I could be a member. But then the continuity programs and memberships have also been so cool to see. And I'd, I'd love for those listening, like if you're just doing straight up PT or straight up OT or chiropractic or whatever, and you don't have a continuity program, what's amazing about it is that it literally takes maybe 10 minutes of planning of like, well, what would our continuity program be? <laughs> you know, plan it out, price it out, and then just start offering it to your current clients. Over time, you'll you'll get yeses and you'll have revenue, recurring revenue that wouldn't have been there otherwise, right? But outside of that, I mean, like, can you give us a better idea of exactly what that conditioning program after a plan of care looks like? How long is it? How do you price it? That kind of a thing. And then that ongoing long-term membership, can you give us more detail on that? So maybe someone listening could reproduce what you've done? Sure. 
So our physical therapy is actually structured on a 45-minute appointments. And any day have a shockwave appointment as well. It's like then 60 minutes. But and it, it incorporates, you know, comprehensive care, like modalities, manual, you know, therapeutic exercises, education, all that stuff. As we actually progress to conditioning program, we drop sessions to half an hour. And it is half an hour of intense exercises, including stretching, strengthening, and cardio. And we structure, you know, to, you know, target areas that are areas of weakness. And twice a week for that program for six weeks is 1400. And once a week is 700. (laughs) And as we progress to membership, we actually offer a once a month membership or twice a month membership. But lately, I'm just offering twice a month membership as a follow ups when they come every second week. And then they can also use our gym. They can come and exercise. They can use our modalities, you know, red light, electromagnetic field therapy, cold laser, massage chair, you know, on a walk in basis. But they have two sessions a month for follow up. And this is priced at two seven. Okay, great. And what we'll do, just for those, uh, I'm sure I'll announce it in the little intro, but we're going to be doing, you know, our featured mastermind member Q&A with you. And in that Q&A, I'll make sure that we get into the details of how you sell people essentially from plan of care to saying yes to that conditioning program. And then from conditioning program to saying yes to your membership, because Lily has just been a master of that. And I mean, I remember when we first did your annual, we just, I said, look, we need at the end of the year, we wanted to hit a goal. Right. And we said, December is usually a a short, a slower month. We're going to need to do something big. I was like, let's do an annual membership promotion, give an extra discount. And I think you did over $50,000 last at the end of last year in a week. So you talk about being good at selling things through individual conversations, as well as, as email. She's really nailed it there. And we'll, we'll get into the details of that in our call this coming Tuesday. But outside of that, I mean, just getting you, now you guys have the general structure of what they offer and how they price those memberships. I also wanted to kind of point out, and I'll just do it via a question. Lily, tell us the size of staff and who is actually seeing the, the clients for, you know, evals and follow-up care. So on the team, I have two administrators and three PTAs. And one of my PTAs is also director of operations. So she's responsible for HR issues. And I'm a main therapist and I evaluate, reevaluate and discharge. I progress to different programs, but most of the care is actually delivered by Great. PTAs. And so I, I bring this up and I highlight it because for a long time, I felt the same way as, oh, well, you know, people aren't going to go out of network if they're getting treatment from PTAs. Here we see you have a lot of happy customers, over a hundred five-star reviews, and y'all are doing great. Clearly the PTAs are delivering amazing care. I mean, I personally just, this is a little more, you know, kind of icing on the cake or just, I guess, personal advice is doubt how great the care can be based on the letters behind their name. And even, you know, here at our house, we have a lot of cash pay therapists that come. We work more than with than any of the therapists we have as a PTA, she's private, comes and sees my kids three times a week. And so I pay her over $20,000 a year cash pay. And she's a PTA and she's absolutely amazing. She runs circles around many, many, many of the PTs I've worked with and known out there, you know, really Mm -hmm. seen them clinically. And I'm not saying that to upset any PTs, but I'm just saying like, don't let that dissuade you. And And it can work very well in the cash pay out of network model. So just wanted to kind of highlight that because that's a a mindset I had, you know, that's been completely 180 shifted and your practice is certainly part of the mindset shift for me. So I thank you for that. So as you have been dropping contracts, can you talk about any of the challenges in doing so, whether it's challenges of maintaining clients or challenges of dealing with the insurances as you go through the process, just for someone else is looking to go through this themselves in their own practice and needs to pull the trigger. What should they look out for as they go through it? I mean, challenges are uh, staying with the regions for another year that we didn't expect. You know, we thought that 
it's 180 days, but then they added, you know, with a small print in, in a contract that we have to serve their, their patients for another year after that day, which was surprise. And that, that was new. Can, the I other- just, can I just explain that a little? So it was earlier this year at the time of this recording, we thought you had a date for when you would be officially fully out of network with all payers. And the last one was Regents up in your area. Mm-hmm. And when you first got network with them some 10 years before or whatever it was, there was no clause. The, the clause, the understanding was you give them 180 days notice and then you're out of network. Yeah. But every year when you renewed, instead of, and this would be something to look out for, for those who are in network, if they're just sending you something to sign that's a renewal and you sign it, you're agreeing to everything. They can change it. And they did. They changed it on you guys. You didn't know until you got there and they said, oh, no, no. in the most recent contract you signed, you're literally having to process our, you know, all our clients as if you're, you're still in network. You're essentially forced to stay in network for not just 180 days, but 180 days plus a year. Is that yeah. 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 Like, unbelievable. I mean, truly unbelievable. Yeah. It's, yeah, I, we could go on and on about that, but that's probably, you know, that's why we're all here. It's why the people listening to this are listening to this. Um, yeah. We'd be preaching to the choir there, but so that would be one thing to look out for. Yeah. What about staff mindset amongst staff? I mean, did you, any lessons learned when it comes to staffing a practice that is predominantly in network? And your admin is saying, yes, we do take Blue Cross versus going out of network. And now what does that staff look like? How, how do things change or need to change? It is. It was a gradual change in language, you know, and scripts that we use and, you know, navigating one insurance at a time, learning new things over the time and believing in your services, believing that that we are worth, you know, paying cash, having highly motivated staff. Yeah, I also am on almost one system where my administrator is actually paid based on the volumes of the whole clinic. So she's motivated to keep our our schedule full and that's beneficial as well. You call, you said onus one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. So- and solving issues one at a time, you know, as we actually go from mostly network to mostly out of network our language and scripts you know changed and in a direction that we listen and encourage patients to talk more about their problem and more about their dreams and more about you know what they want to accomplish instead of do take mention solely for those I, I, every year I, not every year but most years i go to the private practice section conference for the APTA and I, and it's predominantly, you know, practice owners that are insurance based and time and again, I come across so many that really, really want to do what you've done, but for any variety of reasons, they never pull the trigger or most of them don't. And now we're seeing that a lot of them are, are having to sell their clinics to large conglomerates or just go out of business because the transition out of network, the, the move towards more cash pay percentage of revenue is something that they just can never get themselves to do. And so I would love for you to speak to that person out there that really knows they want to do this and they need to do this, but they need to hear something that they've not been hearing maybe to get over the fence and make it happen. What would you say to that type of person or practice owner? I would definitely, you know, say to hire Jared. Right. I mean, I, I, mean <laughs> I was so frustrated with the insurance. It was horrible. And I actually jumped the gun and, and I just said, I'm done. And I just sent letters to all insurance companies saying I'm done. And, and I'll almost, you know, sink the ship. Yeah. But, you know, I started talking to Jared and, you know, pulled some of those letters, you know, and then did the process gradually and, and over the time, it just worked. You know, it was like, it's not that we actually expanded our sessions, you know, to spend more time with patients. We actually, you know, had less visits. You know, we were just not really mill anymore. And while we were making more money, I mean, it was great. I mean, Jerry's guidance, you know, it was it was so valuable. I think that that I would be out of the business if I did my way. Well, thank you for that. I didn't, I wasn't really trying to pull that answer out. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it is true. <laughs> yes. 
what I, how I would kind of translate that to folks is that it's going to be scary, but it doesn't have to be risky. That's like, I, there's almost nothing that you can do or that I could say, or anyone could say that's going to like totally dissolve the incredible fear around that. And especially if you've got a really large operation, a lot of people relying on, you know, certain amount of volume to, to, you know, stay in business, that kind of thing. But it, but it doesn't have to be high, high risk. And, and the concept of going slow one at a time and preemptively replacing the visits that you think you're going to lose with cash pay visits already. That's the key. That's what, that's what really gets rid of the risk is because, yeah. because I generally say, don't go drop in contracts that have a certain percentage of your volume. If ahead of time, you haven't like really kind of creeped up that volume of cash pay to, to fill in the gaps, like you're not going to lose all 20%, right? You're just not. I mean, if you follow the right scripts and you, you there's a lot of things that you can do, you're not going to lose a ton, but if you do lose some, it's already pre replaced, right? That's the name of the game in, in my opinion. And so the fear is always going to be there, but the risk doesn't have to be. And, yeah. And so I, I hope that we can have more of our colleagues really level up their, what they're offering. Like you said, we, we increased how much time we're spending. We added, you know, high tech modalities and all these kind of things, because you can't, you can't expect people to, to stick with you and just start paying more out of pocket if you're not offering more than what you, they were current, they were getting before. Right. I mean, that, that's a given, right. But yeah. imagine, you know, being able to level up and provide a level of care that you've always wanted to, and have been somewhat limited in what you could provide because of insurance constraints and doing that, expanding your practice, increasing your profits without the risk of the ship sinking. And because that's yeah. the model that you have gone through. And finally in February, because of regions year edition, you'd already be a hundred percent out of network this year, but then they, they snuck in that clause on you, but we'll soon, mm -hmm. enough, not too far off. And you're already, she had mentioned adding shockwave this year. So I was like, okay, we got 20% that we're going to drop last 20%. How are we going to replace that ahead of time? Yeah. Because they're already doing. It's awesome. Yeah. So, well, this has been awesome. And of course, we're going to do an even deeper dive on kind of the nitty gritty details and, and anything that the group members in the mastermind coaching program come up with from listening to this and just, you know, getting your support and feedback over the, over time. This is not the first time you'll be, you'll have been mm -hmm. a future Q and A member. So we'll get into a lot of the stuff, a lot of stuff on sales and scripts, things like that in this upcoming call. And I expect Lily will be a, a member of the group and a, open for questions for some time to come. So if you're listening to this and you want to pick her brain, you know, please consider joining us at, at uh, drjaredcarter.com forward slash mastermind. Anything else, Lily, that you'd love to pass on, whether it's someone who wants to transition out of network or someone who just wants to start their own practice or grow it in some way, any other bits of advice or sage wisdom that you have for us today? Well, I think, you know, we cannot do it alone. You know, we definitely need a village. We need a good mentor and coach. We need friends. We need members to pick the brain. It, it can be a very lonely place, you know, once you transition from the staff therapist to owner of the company. There's so many small things, nitty gritty things that we don't, we don't have answer with for. It's also, you know, learning leadership and hiring skill is very important you know and being clear from the day one what what kind of culture you want and hiring members of the team who are actually great fit for the culture that's must otherwise it doesn't work it takes a village build a good team based on mm -hmm. culture more than anything love it yeah great way to finish thank you again lily really appreciate thank it you. looking forward to your in-depth q a in the group next tuesday yeah thank you Talk to you soon. Sounds good. Thanks. Bye.